we'll be starting our webinar uh, titled Rapid Adaptation of Clinical and, uh, Pathways and Clinical Practice uh, Guidelines. Uh, it's my pleasure to be the moderator for, this such, for such an important webinar. And it's also my pleasure to present our expert uh, speaker, Dr. Abdullah Hamad Khmizan. Dr. Abdullah is uh, a family medicine consultant with subspeciality in clinical epidemiology and evidence-based medicine practice. Uh, he's uh, consulted in King Faisal uh, uh, Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Riyadh. Uh, Dr. Abdullah received his uh, Canadian uh, Board of Family Medicine in the year 2000 from the University of Toronto. He also completed his fellowship training in the same University of Toronto in the year 2001 of palliative and uh, geriatrics medicine. He was also awarded the American Board of uh, Hospice and Palliative Medicine in the year 2002. On top of that, he has a master's degree of health system and quality management in the year 2009, and master's degree of uh, medical law and ethics, University of Edinburgh. Thank you very much for being with us, Dr. Abdullah. And for our uh, audience, uh, please, if you have any questions, write them in the Q&A, and I'll be moderating and sharing the questions with Dr. Abdullah at the end of the lecture. We may start, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, Thank you very much again, and thank you for organizing this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, honored and uh, delighted to be, uh, you know, part of this uh, activity. Uh, uh, clinical practice guidelines and clinical pathways are emerging as a very important uh, way to standardize the care uh, all over the world. Uh, but I think this is especially applicable. Uh, in our country uh, because uh, the fact that uh, we have people coming from all over the world uh, practicing uh, in our country and that's why I think the emphasis on standardizing the, the care in our country is, is uh, even more important uh, than probably other countries. The fact that uh, practice in our country also is variable uh, and um, some sort of uh, privileges, uh, especially in certain areas, certain sectors, uh, not very clear uh, what are the privileges of uh, uh, somebody who is a specialist versus a senior registrar versus a resident versus a consultant versus a subspecialized consultant. Uh, it, it's, it's not very clear uh, in some of the uh, you know, practices in our country. That's why I think uh, creation of um, uh, uh, clinical practice guidelines and clinical pathways are extremely important and this is of interest of many parties in our country. Uh, one of them is the uh, CCHI, uh, the uh, Cooperative Council for Health uh, Insurance, uh, which is uh, getting more and more interested in these uh, clinical pathways and clinical practice guidelines uh, to try to standardize the care, the care in the private sector. Also, other, other uh, parties are also interested in this business. Uh, the uh, Council for Health Services, Saudi Council for Health Services, the Saudi Commission uh, for uh, Health Specialities are also interested in this business. The different clusters now in our country are also interested, the Ministry of Health are also interested in this. And that's why I think it's very important to talk about uh, uh, these uh, concepts. This is what I will try to uh, do in this uh, brief uh, presentation. So uh, I'll try to give, to present a process of rapid local adaptation uh, of clinical practice guideline and clinical pathways. Uh, so uh, I will focus on, again, a rapid uh, way of uh, local adaptation, rapid and hopefully practical way of local adaptation of evidence-based clinical practice guideline and clinical pathways uh, in, in, in our country. Uh, I mean, someone might ask, uh, okay, what is the evidence that evidence-based clinical practice guidelines or, uh, or uh, evidence-based clinical pathways work or have extra benefit than other uh, kind of usual uh, practice. This, this issue was raised uh, in a very uh, strong way uh, like uh, early in the 90s uh, because we did not, at that time, we did not ha have good evidence that the concept of evidence-based medicine and evidence-based clinical practice guideline and evidence-based clinical pathways uh, will, will add much to the practice. But I think at this era, uh, things are, 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 are to, to a great extent clear. Uh, many research was published in this, in this field, uh, the implementation of evidence-based clinical practice guideline, the management 
of of uh, of patient with with congestive heart failure resulted in um, more than uh, around uh, 8000 quality adjusted life years uh, pound uh, for for the so for the suspected uh, uh, heart failure population and the threshold where we accept you know something to be cost effective is around 20000 so it's clear that you know that intervention was was very cost effective implementation of IVIG uh, pathways uh, in an ICU setting was associated with a significant reduction in, in hospital mortality, uh, reduction uh, by 50% uh, in surgical site infection uh, following a, you know, a protocol and pathway for, for uh, prophylaxis, antibiotic prophylaxis to prevent this infection. Uh, reduction in hospital acquired uh, ventilation associated uh, pneumonia uh, through the application of an evidence based clinical pathway uh, in the ICU setting, uh, reduction in the mortality of brain uh, injured patient uh, following the implementation of uh, a brain injury uh, uh, clinical pathway. And so on. So, so I think this question is crystal clear. And if you think about it, what is what is evidence-based medicine? What is evidence-based clinical practice guideline or clinical practice pathways? It's the implementation of existing research, translating existing research into pathway to uh, make sure that that research will be implemented. And this is a huge issue uh, in the field of medicine. Lots of research, but uh, uh, barriers when it comes to implementation. And that's why one of these tools to overcome the, 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 the barriers for the implementation of research, of science into practice, is the utilization of evidence-based clinical practice guideline, evidence-based clinical pathways, uh, decision support tools in the era of uh, electronic medical records. Uh, uh, so, so uh, and that's why, I mean, uh, the whole world now is interested in this, in this business, especially clinical pathways, uh, because clinical, path, clinical practice guidelines involve the academia, the, uh, you know, academic part of, of, of reviewing the uh, evidence, uh, while clinical pathways, it's, it's more, you know, um, directed to the uh, healthcare professionals uh, at the, the end user of the, of, the clinical, of the clinical practice guidelines. And that's why all clinical practice guidelines will most likely contain clinical pathways. And that's why many agencies now, uh, leading agencies in the world, now they are focusing more on clinical pathways because it can consume time and uh, be more practical in, in, in touching base with the uh, uh, end users. Like for example, NICE. NICE now is shifting uh, their resources, although they're still doing the uh, clinical practice guideline, they are doing excellent clinical practice, evidence-based clinical practice guideline, but also they are, they are shifting uh, some of the resources to develop uh, clinical pathways. Uh, we will come to that. Uh, why we think of adaptation of clinical practice guidelines? Why don't we just develop, uh, you know, clinical practice guidelines from uh, scratch, uh, de novo? Uh, and the reason is because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and some of the, those countries that, you know, develop really a robust, high-quality, evidence-based clinical uh, practice guideline, they spend a huge amount of money and resources to develop these evidence-based clinical practice guidelines. Uh, and in our country, uh, and many countries actually are taking this, this uh, you know, approach, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Let's get high quality evidence-based clinical practice guidelines or clinical pathways and let's you know uh, just uh, do uh, the adaptation and let's implement it in our city. Uh, countries like uh, UK for example for NICE which is like one of the role model you know uh, guideline and clinical pathway agencies in the world uh, they, they invest a huge amount of money uh, like around one billion uh, one billion uh, pound uh, is, is the annual budget of an agency like NICE. A huge amount of money. Uh, I don't think this will happen in the near future in our country, and that's why let's uh, utilize what, whatever is done by you know, NICE, by the US Task Force for Preventable Services, by Queensland, you know, in Australia guidelines, and other guidelines in, in, in the world, uh, and, and American guideline, Canadian guideline uh, agencies, and, and, and just let's build on them. Uh, let's just go quickly through the process of developing uh, evidence-based clinical practice guideline from scratch. Uh, so, so 
one of the yeah, uh, most uh, important methodology uh, that was, was developed in this regard was developed actually by the Canadian task, task Force on the uh, preventive or in the periodic health examination. Uh, and they developed what they call the, the uh, analytic framework methodology for the developing uh, clinical practice guideline. And this methodology was adopted by the US uh, Preventive Services uh, Task Force in the, in the 80s. Uh, I was actually uh, lucky enough to be, uh, you know, the principal author of, of one of the uh, Canadian Task Force uh, guidelines. Uh, so I went through the process, uh, and I, I know that it's it's a very demanding uh, process. We took two two years to develop to develop uh, a guideline about the use of antioxidant vitamins in the prevention of cardiovascular disease and cancer. Uh, this is just one item uh, which relate to vitamin E. Uh, utilization and we, we do you know you should do that I mean for different types of vitamins vitamin A E D B and so on B6 B1 and and, and so on uh, so this is the targeted both population which is the uh, the uh, adult uh, and the intervention is vitamin E uh, and there is intermediate uh, you know uh, outcomes uh, which is you know oxidized LDL and other outcomes uh, whether it's associated uh, or not with the reduction of mor mortality, mortality, morbidity and mortality, whether vitamin E, which is line number two, which is uh, whether vitamin E has direct uh, impact on reducing morbidity and mortality without passing through uh, the uh, association, which is number four, what are the adverse events, uh, and you need to do that for all of these interventions. And for each line, you should create list of questions that you need to search for and try to answer. Uh, so, um, and you need to 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 uh, uh, review uh, the literature for each question. All these uh, you know lines uh, will create questions. Uh, whether you know uh, what's the prevalence of vitamin deficiency among adults, for example, this is number one. Uh, is there that evidence that vitamin E will reduce morbidity, cardiovascular disease, colon uh, cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and different type of cancer? Uh, these are questions that you list. Um, whether uh, vitamin E will affect oxidized LDL, colorectal polyps, and other intermediate outcomes. Is there association between oxidized LDL and mortality, and coronary disease, and you know different kinds of outcome, and so on. So lots of questions. You will end up with uh, around 50, 60 questions with each analytic module. And each question, you go and search for it. Then you start with another uh, intervention, which is, this is the, related to vitamin E, then vitamin B6, then vitamin B, then vitamin D, and so on. Uh, so a huge list of questions, you'll end up with 600, 700 research questions that you should go to the literature and search for it and try to get the, you know, different studies uh, that, that have studied this uh, intervention. Then you go and review the internal uh, and external validity. Internal validity relates with whether, whether the, that study measured what it's meant to be measured within, within its own population. External validity, whether that study is applicable in your own setting or not, or in the general uh, setting or not. So you go through a systematic review, randomized control trial, cohort studies, case control studies, cross-sectional studies, uh, you know, demographics and uh, of, of, of the study population, and so on the different interventions, then you create the different, uh, we call it evidence tables, uh, which, which uh, you know, has two dimensions. The, the first dimension is the evidence table that describes the characteristic of each individual study, uh, including the quality, the comparative group, the uh, different outcomes, whether it was blinded or not, if it's a randomized control trial, uh, are there any other confounder, uh, did it have adequate, uh, adequate uh, power or not, uh, and uh, you know, uh, intention to treat principle was applied. Uh, ad uh, ad uh, follow up uh, or not, and and other other question which describe the characteristic of each study. Then you have to create another important evidence table which include the different outcomes and the result of different outcomes. Uh, uh, you know, using whatever statistical measure that was used, either relative risk or odds ratio. Uh, and what's the the quality of of that study? With any comment that you you you, you would like to to add, uh, then you uh, uh, come up with the final conclusion based on all of these review in our actually you know uh, guideline that was published by the Canadian Task Force. Uh, 
uh, we concluded that vitamin uh, E actually is, is not recommended. Actually, it's harmful because we found uh, two studies, two major studies, a large, huge randomized control trial uh, that have shown that uh, you know, antioxidant vitamins, including vitamin E, is associated with harms, increase the risk of cancer, lung cancer namely, uh, and increase the risk of hemorrhagic stroke, among other adverse events. So this was the recommendation. And by the way, when we, when we published uh, this uh, recommendation, the U.S. task force was not happy about it. Because you know, you in the United States, the recommendation with vitamins is a huge. Uh, so they decided to do it again. Usually, the Canadian and the American task force they, they collaborate with each other. So if I do something, you can do that. You invest in something else. But they decided to do it actually. And when they did it, uh, they came up with exactly the same conclusion. Uh, and that's why it's 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 a, this is just for a simple you know kind of. Um, evidence-based clinical practice guideline about you know, the use of vitamin E, very small entity, but think of something more comprehensive, hypertension, diabetes, you know, uh, something more, more, more big. You will need huge resources uh, to do that. And that's why we need to think seriously of adapt adaptation, or local adaptation of evidence-based clinical practice guideline and clinical pathways. What do we mean by adaptation? Uh, adaptation is a systematic methodology for utilizing a pre-existing guideline and a uh, clinical pathway uh, developed in one context, in the Canadian context, in the American context, in the Australian context, in the British context, uh, to be used in another a new context, the Saudi context in this, in this example, putting in consideration local circumstances and, and uh, uh, con uh, constraints. Uh, uh, so uh, it will reduce time, uh, you know, uh, effort, resources, expertise, uh, in developing uh, clinical practice uh, guidelines and, and clinical uh, pathways, uh, so uh, you can you can this will facilitate the utilization of also the evidence that was made in one sitting because you know studies uh, you know uh, the field of medicine is not secretive most of the studies are published uh, and uh, are there so if someone analyzes that that study and you know that that agency is a good a robust agency probably even need to repeat what what they have done generally speaking so we we actually i mean there are different suggested adaptation methodology i think we published one of the first actually adaptation methodology in 2004 uh, there are other adaptation methodology that was adopted by international bodies like adapt uh, by the uh, Guideline International uh, Network in 2009, uh, can implement uh, by the Canadian uh, agencies in 2011. Uh, SNABIT uh, was, was suggested by 2014 in collaboration between uh, McMaster University and other you know, Canadian agencies. Uh, rapid adaptation uh, was suggested in 2004 and was you know, evolved and developed more on, uh, more uh, recently. Uh, was was suggested by a Norwegian group actually, uh, and they collaborated with McMaster University uh, to just prove the concept. And uh, you know the the, the 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 analysis, the methodology is very interesting, and that's why uh, I will focus on it today. Uh, grade development uh, is another uh, methodology that was suggested by Grade Group, a very important agency when it comes to the adaptation of clinical practice guideline, and they are led by 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 uh, McMaster University. So rapid adaptation and grade development they are close to each other. I will focus on uh, rapid uh, adaptation. I think we have to be practical in this era. The fact that you know we are we are our healthcare system is changing and changing rapidly. I think we need to match that with rapid adapt adaptation. Uh, in the old days. Uh, uh, we used to, to uh, recommend using agree instrument whenever you try to do the local adaptation. Agree instrument is a very important instrument that was established uh, in around the year 2003-2002, uh, uh, and it's a way to uh, locally adapt uh, clinical practice guideline. Uh, one of the most important, uh, you know, steps is the selection of the clinical practice guidelines. So AGREE will rate different guidelines and will help you to select the best clinical practice guideline. However, the problem with AGREE, it's a very demanding uh, instrument. Uh, it's a very long uh, instrument. It contains six domains, 23 items, and 
you have to have at least four, five different raters to rate these guidelines. Um, uh, you need special, special kind of training. Uh, the instrument itself also in terms of validity and reliability was not great in terms of the you know, figures of uh, validity and reliability. Uh, and that's why uh, with, the local, with the rapid adaptation, they skipped this step. And I think it was successful uh, because uh, sometimes when you apply, I mean, one, one of our colleagues, he told me that we did an adaptation of uh, anticoagulation uh, guideline. And I, I asked them, I looked at it, they did actually agree, and they did not include a very important, uh, you know, authoritative, authoritative kind of, of uh, guideline, which is the, uh, the, the just American uh, guideline, which is a standard of care you know, all over the world when it comes to anticoagulation therapy. He, he told me no, because they did not pass a green instrument. So, and this is one of the problems of a green instrument. Some of the, you know, most robust guideline might not pass the agree instrument when you compare it to other smaller guidelines. And I told him, uh, I told my colleague, I mean, if you did not include, you know, the, the, the uh, anticoagulation guideline from chest, I don't think anybody, you know, any hematologist or, or uh, internist will accept uh, that guideline. And the same thing, when you, uh, you know, try to locally adapt a uh, guideline about diabetes, you have to include the uh, American Diabetes Association, the standard of care, whether we like it or not. And the same thing when it comes to hypertension, GNC, uh, and so on. And that's why uh, with this rapid methodology, uh, which was suggested again by a Norwegian group uh, in collaboration with McMaster University, you don't need a green instrument. So it's an, it's an advantage. Uh, now let's go and talk to the, uh, this methodology of rapid adaptation of clinical pathways guideline and clinical pathways. The first step is the step of uh, planning. Uh, so uh, you choose a topic like low back pain or uh, you know um, uh, any 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 topic that is related to, to to this low back pain for example or back pain or neck pain. Uh, then you have your to your team uh, usually four or five uh, you know more or less uh, specialized in the area. Okay, it's better to be different you know specialities. Uh, it would be nice to have. Uh, uh, other, other uh, you know, specialities, even other allied health with, with, with you, if possible, uh, like physiotherapists, for, for example, uh, nursing, uh, maybe a GB, uh, be part of the team, if, if possible. Uh, of course, conflict of, of interest uh, should be uh, declared. Uh, then you select one to two guideline or clinical pathway, or three. So one to three clinical practice guideline or, or, or clinical pathways to be selected. So you don't go and search for 10, then you do agree, then you select among the, 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 the uh, three. Uh, so this is one of the things that, you know, is, is like shortcut when it comes to the process of local adaptation of clinical practice guideline. These guidelines should be uh, coming from international, uh, you know, uh, authoritative guidelines if possible. Uh, should be published within the last two to three years just to accommodate any recent evidence. Uh, you should take the, uh, get the permission to adapt and usually this is not a, uh, this is not an issue because most of the clinical pathways and most of the clinical practice guidelines are published uh, and public generally speaking. So uh, this should not be an issue generally speaking. Uh, the level of evidence and grades of recommendation should be, uh, you know, specified clearly within that guideline uh, or clinical pathway, if possible. What do you mean by level of evidence? Level of evidence is the scientific evidence that supports this recommendation scientifically. Grades of recommendation, this relate to whether this uh, recommendation is applicable, whether the benefits of applying this uh, recommendation outweigh its harms uh, and this depends on different things it depends on the outcome we are talking about it depends on the cost it depends on the feasibility of uh, you know utilizing and applying this particular procedure uh, so level of evidence is scientific pure scientific grade of recommendation is the final message to the practicing clinician uh, it will be nice also to, to have the evidence tables uh, that was conducted to come up with the final conclusion. 
uh, usually it will be published within the guideline. If not, you can ask for it. And usually, you know, the group that developed it will provide you with the, with the evidence table, generally speaking. Uh, it will be nice also if that clinical practice guideline uh, is, uh, have used a grade methodology. Grade is, method, grade is an agency, uh, not-for-profit not, not agency, that developed a new way uh, of uh, developing uh, of rating the, the level of evidence. Uh, is there a full uh, presentation, but I'll talk about it in two minutes. Uh, so grade, uh, you know, the, the, the level of evidence and, 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 and the grade of recommendation, level of evidence, which is level one, two, three, uh, level one, systematic review or uh, a randomized control trial, level two, cohort studies, level three, case control cross-section studies, level five, uh, experimental. <clears throat> this is the old way of categorizing evidence. Uh, uh, now, most of the agencies actually they don't like this way and they don't accept it. Why? Because a robust, good, large cohort study might be better than a small, lousy, uh, poorly organized and poorly designed uh, randomized control trial. Based on the old school kind of grading of evidence, all randomized control trial will be level one, be up in the hierarchy of controls, regardless. Cohort studies will be number two, regardless. Uh, when it comes to grade methodology, you know, it depends. You need to look at, you know, the certain details, as again, this is a full, you know, presentation. Uh, but uh, my point is, uh, bottom line, grade recommendation, some of the cohort studies will go above uh, randomized control trial based on the methodology. Grade recommendation right now is used in almost all majority of agencies all over the world, including NICE from UK, including the WHO guidelines, including the uh, American Task Force guidelines, including uh, the uh, most of the guidelines now, even American Diabetes Association, uh, just uh, you know, anticoagulation guidelines. M most of the guidelines right now they are using grade methodology. Uh, so, also part of the planning is to, to go and search for uh, existing clinical practice guidelines or clinical pathways. Most of the guidelines, as I mentioned, will contain pathways. So, you will find the pathways within the uh, clinical practice guidelines, uh, like the National Institute for Healthcare Excellence, NICE, from, from UK, one of the you know, most important agencies all over the world when it comes to the development of clinical practice guidelines and clinical pathways because they have a specific section for clinical pathways. Uh, huge budget uh, behind uh, NICE, uh, you know, more than one billion a pound is spent on this business, so it's, they take it seriously. Uh, the Scottish also have a similar uh, uh, agency, SIGN, uh, also uh, very, very nice. The WHO now is more focusing on evidence-based clinical practice guideline, generally speaking. Uh, the uh, Guideline International uh, Network, they have uh, like uh, a bank of uh, guidelines and pathways can be utilized. Uh, Canadian uh, Medical Association InfoBase, uh, you know, as you know, the Canadian, they are the basis and the origin of the uh, evidence-based medicine movement, and they are the origin of the clinical, uh, clinical guidelines uh, methodology. So they usually produce um, high-quality evidence-based clinical practice guidelines. Uh, Google is, a, is a, another excellent source, uh, to be frank with you, because most of these guidelines, some of these guidelines are not published as a publication, uh, so you might not find them in PubMed, uh, but they, they will, you know, work on them, develop them, and, 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 and also publish uh, these guidelines in, on the internet. Like NICE, for example, most of its uh, guidelines are published in, in, in their website, uh, you can access uh, through, through Google. Uh, and the same thing with uh, searching for clinical pathways. NICE has a very nice, you know, section for clinical pathways, uh, very well, uh, you know, um, organized. Uh, cancer care in the, in, the, in the field of cancer, they develop really robust, high quality uh, clinical pathways. Queensland from Australia, they develop high quality uh, clinical pathways. Again, Google is another important source when it comes to the uh, development of uh, you know, when it comes to searching for uh, clinical pathways, and as I mentioned, majority of clinical pathways and clinical practice guidelines are free, available free on the internet. 
the, the, the next step um, uh, for the uh, rapid adaptation of clinical practice guideline, and these are the five uh, you know, steps for rapid adaptation. The second step is the assessment of the uh, different recommendations. So this review panel that was uh, you know, elected will review each recommendation and they will leave it uh, stand as is, or they will modify it based on the local setting, based on the local resources, based on the you know, um, uh, uh, availability of this uh, or that intervention, based on cost maybe, based on you know, uh, uh, maybe this is not a priority in our, in our local setting for whatever reason, and so on. Maybe it's not acceptable uh, way of doing things in our local setting. For example, in Malta, uh, they managed to do, uh, to, to implement a very nice uh, clinical pathway and clinical practice guideline to try to eliminate uh, uh, thalassemia in the country. And they managed actually to reduce thalassemia uh, to like by more than 99 point something percent. However, their methodology involved prenatal, uh, you know, uh, uh, intragestational uh, kind of diagnosis uh, of uh, early on in the pregnancy of uh, thalassemia and uh, abortion, uh, offering abortion. Uh, so, okay, it's very successful uh, way of doing things, but will it be applicable in our setting? Maybe not. Uh, and some of these recommendations could be excluded for whatever reason. Feasibility, local setting, culture, religion, uh, uh, scientific evidence, uh, and so on. Um, and and you, the group might need to develop new recommendation for for specific uh, you know gap uh, area. It will be you know minor compared to the huge you know uh, and overall uh, guideline or clinical pathway. There will be few points that will need to develop a new recommendation. Uh, Modification also is a very important step, which include the feasibility of the uh, intervention, of the uh, suggested intervention. Maybe we don't have, uh, you know, uh, the resources to do this particular intervention. Uh, maybe the medication is not available, the intervention is not available, um, the culture uh, might not accept it. A cost could be a factor that, you know, okay, we need to modify. For example, when it comes to uh, and we did this actually in our uh, setting, and the setting that I work in, uh, we did a program for uh, colorectal cancer. And we know one of the most very well established uh, uh, methodology of uh, doing uh, screening for colorectal cancer is to uh, a colonoscopy. Colonoscopy is one of the most important you know, way of doing things. Uh, colonoscopy, uh, sigmoidoscopy plus uh, other intervention, uh, but if we are going to uh, send um, uh, around uh, 2,000 patients to colonoscopy, I will block uh, the, the colonoscopy unit in our sitting for the next two years. This is not possible. This is not feasible. Uh, so uh, we utilize uh, fecal occult blood. If the test is positive, we do colonoscopy. So it's very important to look at the feasib feasibility and cost of any intervention that you think of. And you need to look at local gaps. Local gaps include, uh, like, what's the prevalence of this condition or in our disease? Okay, this is a Canadian guideline. They talk about the prevalence in Canada, but okay, what's the prevalence in Saudi Arabia? Uh, or what's the uh, prevalence of, um, uh, what's, what's the cost of this intervention? Okay, maybe it's, 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 it's uh, you know, expensive in that country for whatever reason, but maybe the cost is different in our city, maybe. Um, so, so uh, local gaps, uh, it's, it's very important to address it and include it in the clinical practice guideline or in the clinical pathway. Uh, for example, when it comes to screening for diabetes, uh, the general recommendation in the, based on the American Diabetes Association and other agencies in the world at the age of 45, okay, will this be applicable in our setting? If you ask me, I will say no. Because, okay, uh, diabetes prevalence in the United States is 5%, UK 5%, Canada 5%, but in our country it's 25% uh, of the adult population. And the other 25% of the adult population are pre-diabetic. So for me, I will lower the uh, age of uh, screening to probably 18. Uh, we have data that, you know, uh, by 18, 
uh, around 12% of the population are pre-diabetic. Uh, so, so we have to adjust to uh, local uh, setting, extremely important. Um, also, um, uh, guideline or, or, or clinical pathway that was published in even 2018 or 2019 could miss important uh, uh, landmark publication in 2020 or in 2019. Uh, so, so you probably should, uh, you know, adjust your your um, uh, uh, clinical pathway based on landmark publication uh, in the in the field. Uh, also, uh, I mean, you need to do an updated uh, literature update, uh, uh, literature search, and update uh, if, if there are any landmark uh, studies in the, in the in the field. For example, in the field of diabetes, recently, a few few weeks ago, when the American Diabetes Association published their uh, you know a new recommendation of adding another medication. Uh, in addition to metformin, metformin used to be the standard of care, but now they are they are adding actually other intervention, other medication, mainly SGLT uh, and uh, GLD1 uh, as 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 a, a medication to protect the heart, mainly uh, regardless of the uh, hemoglobin A1C level. So this is a new recommendation that need to be you know addressed and uh, included. Uh, so uh, you have to uh, update uh, the the the, the, the literature. Uh, using uh, midline uh, search, using uh, you know most updated systematic reviews and meta-analysis uh, and so on. Part of the modification is uh, the fact that you will end up uh, developing a new recommendation based on the local setting, based on the feasibility, based on the limitation, local limitation, and so on, uh, and based on the best, uh, most uh, available uh, evidence uh, and most recent available evidence. Uh, also, it's, it's, it's very important, important to use grade methodology as much as possible when you try to incorporate and rate the uh, new recommendation and new evidence if you have to do the analysis yourself. Uh, because the most recent evidence, you might need to do your analysis uh, yourself with the help of experts. Of course, you have to consider the patient, our patient, uh, providers, and culture factors within the uh, within the uh, guideline. Uh, and it's important to send, you know, all these recommendations uh, for for uh, local uh, peer review and international peer review if needed. Uh, and the fourth step is to uh, go ahead and uh, you know publish the, the paper. Uh, you can publish it, of course, uh, online, uh, and let people you know comment on it, receive the comment, and, and you can act upon it. Uh, publish it uh, if you are targeting clinical path guideline. You have to publish with it clinical pathway because, as I mentioned in the beginning, clinical pathway is very important for the end user. It's for the really the actual uh, you know uh, end user uh, they are not uh, many of them they might not be willing to read your uh, 10 20 pages uh, guideline they want like one or two pages that uh, you know with a, with, a, with a diagram that describe the whole uh, guideline so they can scan it quickly and implement it put it in their office uh, for for uh, which will ease the uh, implementation of of the uh, clinical practice guideline uh, it's also very important to summarize the key recommendation uh, based on the uh, clinical practice guideline if you are targeting clinical practice guidelines. Uh, very important also to publish a lay person summary. We are in the era of empowering patient. Uh, so it's very important to, to, to publish a lay person summary. Uh, this is what, the, what NICE is doing. This is what the Cochrane Library, for example, is doing. And it's, it's, it's extremely important. We have to empower our patient uh, to, to, to help in the implementation of the clinical practice guideline and clinical pathways. Uh, you have also to have implementation tools. Um, and one of the implementation tools is the auditing tools. Uh, like, okay, uh, this is the number of uh, MRI that is expected to be done, uh, you know, in a general population. If someone is doing more MRI for back pain, this means he's probably abusing the system. He's probably abusing the, uh, you know, uh, the investigation. Uh, 
uh, maybe X-ray, maybe you know, advice will be will be will be enough. Unless if he's a subspecialist or specialist, that's a different story. And the same thing with diabetes, auditing tool, hemoglobin one c less than seven in fifty percent of the population, for example, or whatever figure you think is applicable in the local setting. Uh, of course, all of these guidelines and clinical pathways need to be updated uh, every uh, two to three years. Uh, the fourth step is the step of uh, publication uh, uh, of the of the guideline in, and the implementation of the guideline. So there should be a training manual describing the guideline, giving some two three clinical scenarios on how to implement the, the clinical pathway or the clinical practice guideline. Clinical pathway is a very important part of the uh, clinical practice, practice guideline. If you are publishing already a clinical pathway, pathway that's 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 fine. You might not, uh, you know, will, will work by itself. Uh, there should be indicators for monitoring, as I mentioned, uh, uh, rate of MRI request, for example, should not exceed certain percentage in the family medicine GP uh, level. Um, uh, hemoglobin one c should be, you know, with this uh, figure. Uh, uh, auditing tools also uh, is another important. How to audit? How to monitor? Uh, the implementation of these uh, guidelines is also uh, are also important. Uh, then the fifth uh, step or step number five is the evaluation of the clinical pathway, which include uh, feedback uh, from peers, from the recipient of these guidelines, uh, reviewing the new evidence uh, in case you know anything is published, uh, updating the guideline. Uh, so this is the summary of the methodology for uh, the uh, rapid adaptation of evidence-based clinical practice guideline. Start with topic prioritization, then finding one to two, two three pathways uh, guideline. Then uh, uh, getting uh, you know the different recommendation uh, of these uh, clinical practice guideline, taking the uh, permission to adapt assessment of the pathway and the guideline, uh, uh, looking for new evidence to cover local gaps uh, and modification of these guidelines accordingly, uh, then uh, develop your own uh, new recommendation if needed, uh, and finally uh, peer review, uh, then publish, then uh, evaluate and uh, reassess uh, and modify uh, the guideline. Uh, and the same thing, uh, you know, uh, apply on clinical pathways. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the different softwares that can be used for mapping uh, the, the clinical pathways. One of them is the uh, uh, PowerPoint, uh, simple, easy to do, but there are more specialized kind of, uh, you know, softwares like uh, Visio, uh, which is cheap, uh, not, not not expensive. Uh, Lucid Chart also is another, you know, uh, uh, tool that can be utilized to map the clinical pathway. Uh, uh, cost around $100 uh, per per Per, per year uh, around around this figure, uh, some of the agencies uh, like uh, Cancer Ontario they recommend uh, diff using different codes uh, like primary care certain code um, you know secondary care surgery radiology uh, uh, different codes for different services when you try to map the uh, clinical practice guideline uh, clinical pathway uh, and different shapes. Uh, for the for the for the uh, guide or the pathway, so uh, intervention, uh, you know, uh, square uh, uh, decision assessment, uh, exit pathway, uh, circle, uh, and so on. Uh, and I think it's it's really useful to to utilize uh, these uh, uh, legend for 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 the uh, pathway. I think it's very interesting being you know uh, implemented actually. Uh, in, in, within within uh, cancer uh, Ontario, uh, and I think it's very interesting. It's it's nice to be implemented. This is, for example, as a, an example of a clinical pathway related to colorectal cancer screening from uh, cancer Ontario. Again, as you can see, very comprehensive, and they will put you know uh, numbers, and you can refer to these numbers down, like as a legend uh, attachment. Uh, they will describe more details related to each uh, step uh, if needed. Uh, Queensland from Australia, again, they produce really high quality 
uh, evidence-based clinical practice guideline available free on their website. This is one guideline uh, in the field of uh, cardiology, chest pain, uh, with description of the different intervention uh, in a very nice comprehensive uh, way. Nice, the mother of all you know, clinical practice guidelines and clinical pathways. They have a specific actually section within a nice uh, devoted for interactive uh, clinical pathways. This is for uh, you know the management of back pain. And as you can see, each step is given a number, and then they will you know um, describe and talk in more details about you know that specific uh, number, number nine, additional specific treatment for sciatica, and they give different suggestion and they give you different links for other. Uh, pathways and guidelines that is li linked to this uh, issue. Other surgical procedure, they talk about other uh, surgical procedures with links related to these uh, other surgical procedures. Uh, having a training man manual attached to the clinical pathway and clinical guideline, I think is very useful. Uh, should be case-based uh, training manual, three to four cases, uh, just for the uh, general practitioners uh, and to be frank with you, again, not all consultants are on the same level, especially in our country. People are coming from all over the world. So it would be nice to have three, four cases, even for consultant specialists, uh, to, to just you know, give them a guide how to implement uh, these um, clinical pathways. Uh, you know, it would be nice to be, to be attached as a PowerPoint presentation, if possible, because uh, you want people to utilize it in their training. Uh, when you prepare it and you put your logo, the logo of the uh, Saudi Society, for example, of spine or you know cardiology or you know, pain and anesthesia, so people can utilize it with the logo. It will be you know a nice contribution to the education uh, within the community. Uh, for example, this is from Nice. Uh, this is uh, for unstable angina, and uh, as you can see, uh, they have a summary version. They have guidance into uh, practice uh, how to use how can you use uh, this and they have a clinical uh, case scenario if you click on the clinical case scenario they will have um, you know uh, different cases uh, describing how to utilize this guideline uh, or pathway uh, you know using different uh, clinical scenario john 65 years old and they will give you the case they will try to resolve the scenario based on the clinical pathway uh, thank you very much. This is the end of uh, this uh, brief uh, presentation, uh, and, and, and thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. Very informative, uh, comprehensive presentation. We have a few questions from the audience. Um, from Dr. Ma'moon, he's asking, how can you get permission to adopt, and to what extent can you adopt, and can you merge several guidelines together in one adaptation? Uh, generally speaking, most of the guidelines are available free on the internet, and the agency like NICE, like you know Queensland, they put it on the internet because you know generally speaking they don't mind you know to share it with the world. Uh, so you can communicate with NICE, send them an email, uh, or Queensland, or Cancer Ontario, or you know any other agency. Generally speaking, most of the agencies they will not mind uh, you know uh, you adopting uh, their guidelines. Generally speaking. Uh, and this is the beauty of the of the Robin adaptation, as suggested by the the uh, Norwegian and the uh, McMaster group. Uh, you don't need to get six, seven, eight, you know, different guidelines because this is the old methodology. Adapt and other old methodology. They recommend actually to get four, uh, eight, nine, as much as you can. Then you rate them uh, using a green instrument, uh, using four or five raters. A very long story will take you at least you know, six months just to uh, work on, on, on this uh, business if you are successful. And that's why now focus on scan the guideline, focus on two to three, and adopt, uh, you know, uh, uh, do your local adaptation based on these two to three uh, pathway or guidelines. All right. Uh, second question. So you mentioned the layperson summary. Uh, the question is, if we do develop our own guidelines, do we need to translate in Arabic part of it? Absolutely. I think it's it's very important to have a layperson, uh, you know, summary. Uh, you don't need to translate the whole guideline. Uh, I think because you know English is the main language among healthcare professionals. In, in our country. So I don't think that, that that shouldn't be an issue, generally speaking, but it will be nice to have a translation of the summary. 
So we empower uh, our, our uh, patients. So the patient come and ask his physician, okay, I have this. Okay, I'm due for screening for a colorectal. Uh, I need to do it, or a mammogram, or you know, whatever uh, related to this particular uh, pathway. Or if you think that, uh, okay, uh, for back pain, if you have these symptoms, you need to go to the emergency, and maybe a surgical intervention is uh, the, the resolution. Uh, so we have to empower a patient. Okay, uh, next question. So, uh, uh, so is there any difference between pathways for hospital and pathways at the society level that covers the whole country, or they should be identical? I think it, the setting is different. We talk about primary care, different resources, different capabilities, uh, different privileges, uh, you know, when you compare it to in-hospital care. And I think that's why I think in general, uh, we should have, uh, you know, a guide for the, uh, and as you know, our country with the transformation, there is a new focus on uh, primary care family medicine, primary care uh, all over the country, but we, we have a major problem uh, in our primary care, uh, current primary care system. Majority of those who are working in the primary care centers, they are not trained uh, as, 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 as a GP or, or, or family physician. The majority of them are MDs. They just graduated from uh, you know university and they're working there as a primary care physician. This does not happen in most of the setting in the world. It does not happen in UK, in Canada, in the state. And that's why um, they deserve to have some sort of guidance uh, when it comes to back pain, for example, this is their limitation. This is the uh, when you see these, you know, red flags, you have to refer to the specialist of the hospital, uh, and that's why I think we should have uh, in most of the guidelines we, sh we, sh we should have different sets: one targeting primary care physician and one targeting in hospital subspecialist, specialist, you know, kind of care. Okay. Uh, Dr. Imre Bnayan is asking, in your view, uh, what what what, who, uh, what groups are most suitable to lead? The process of guideline and pathway adaptation. I think, I mean, uh, the, 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 the best way to do it is to do it through specialists in the area with uh, some, uh, again, uh, where our country's healthcare is transforming in our country. Most of the care with the new, you know, model of care will be taken care in the, in the, in the primary care setting. Uh, yes, it's not happening right now, it's happening slowly, but it's for sure it will happen because you know this is the focus of the country and that's why i think we need to involve a few uh, gb uh, family physician primary care physician uh, within these guy most of the guidelines unless if it's something sub specialized uh, you know um, treatment of oncology uh, you know which will not will never be uh, done by a family physician i think you don't need a family physician but i think uh, most of these guidelines measurement of back pain for example measurement of chest pain you need to educate and involve uh, those uh, primary care physicians uh, within the, the development of these guidelines. All right. Uh, ne next question from Dr. Uh, Leo. Is there numeric ranking in grade methodology, like the level of evidence? If so, how many grades? And can you say it in brief, please? Uh, grade uh, deserve a whole uh, presentation, and it's extremely important uh, concept. Uh, grade. It has a different philosophy. Uh, so, um, for all randomized control trials, they will start high in the level of evidence. Uh, however, it, they can be lowered with certain criteria, including the randomization, the follow-up rate, the intention to treat, uh, uh, and other other parameters. Uh, all observational studies will start low, but they can be, uh, you know, raised in the hierarchy of evidence based on different criteria, uh, including consistency, more than one, one study is giving the same, and including all, different you know, parameters again. So uh, grade methodology uh, uh, take a different approach, and that's why you, will, you might see a randomized controlled trial or a cohort study uh, higher than you know, the, the, the uh, a randomized controlled trial in, the, in their analysis in the hierarchy of, uh, of uh, evidence. And grade is it's extremely important to understand Great to be frank with you, uh, because great now uh, in the old days we were saying okay it's too complicated let's not mention it to to uh, you know the general you know uh, healthcare professionals but now we have to because now if you go to WHO guideline if you go to anticoagulation chest if you go to American Diabetes guide uh, all guideline now they talk about they all mention great. All right. Uh, next question. Um, so you mentioned the difference in cultures and in societies and in different parts of the world. Uh, so there is a question that uh, taking surgical site infection 
clinical practice guidelines and antibiotic prophylaxis. And in this setting, in, in our country, we have high rate of diabetes, and in theory, we have higher incidence. Do we need our local studies first to identify the incidence of surgical site infection and then do our clinical practice guidelines, or should we just adopt what they have in other societies for this particular if ask, topic? If you ask me, I will say we have to go and adopt. And in terms of the you know, part of any guideline, any pathway, you just give a brief description of the current situation in, in, in the country. So we need to go and try to get uh, from the literature what is the rate of uh, you know, uh, uh, post-surgical infection, for example, in our country. And you mention it. Uh, unless if you think that, okay, there is something, this is, there is something unique about, about us, uh, then you change it uh, based on the local setting. But uh, in general, we adopt whatever, whatever uh, is, is recommended internationally, unless there is something logically that needs to be changed. Yes, we change it. Okay. Uh, we have two more questions. And uh, in your opinion, who should develop the clinical practice guidelines? Is it a soci societies or the Ministry of Health? Ideally, personally, I think, ideally there should be an agency in our country devoted for develop, developing clinical practice guidelines. Something like what we see in, in, in UK NICE, for example. Uh, and uh, I mean, again, Queensland, they have one department that is working on this. Uh, you can work uh, with uh, that agency, can work with the different societies uh, to, to, to develop uh, these uh, guidelines. Uh, and uh, the, 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 that, that agency should be also have some authority Again, I think personally the best model in the world when it comes to the implementation of clinical practice guideline, because the development of clinical practice guideline is a challenge, but implementation is a, another huge challenge. Uh, the nice thing about the UK system, generally speaking, they have their problem, they have their you know issues, uh, is the fact that it's one you know agency that develop and execute. Uh, so they go and measure. They have the right to go and measure in each hospital. What is your rate of X, Y, Z, and there are financial incentives attached to if you have your vaccination rate exceeding certain number, okay, you will get more money. Uh, and it's financial, you know, uh, it's always nice to say uh, that yeah. we don't care about financial as physician, but in reality, this is what's happening in UK. And actually in UK, they put certain standards uh, and they thought that the bar was very high. And they were surprised that, you know, practices are exceeding that bar. Uh, I mean, the explanation, my, my uh, opinion is, is the fact that was attached to some sort of financial incentives. And that's why people were working hard on, on it. I think this is the ideal uh, situation. Uh, well, it's not happening in our country. I think there are thoughts around it, uh, different you know, agencies, different, but unfortunately not yet implemented. Currently, in my view, the best way is to support uh, uh, you know, the different Saudi societies to develop these guidelines. Okay, uh, so one last question and then we'll have to conclude. Uh, so Dr. Khaled Asir is asking the opposite. If we have local guidelines and should we merge it with international guidelines to improve it or just uh, utilize our own local guidelines or regional guidelines? Uh, it depends. Uh, I mean, if it's robust, built on all of these, you know, stringent uh, criteria, uh, will be nice. Uh, I mean, I, I've, I've read most of the guidelines in, in, in our country personally, and I can tell you majority of these guidelines are developed um, uh, like with, with some sort of the adaptation. Uh, very few guidelines that build that evidence table from scratch for all of their recommendations. I'm, I'm not aware of any actually. Majority, they develop their guideline based on local adaptation. Otherwise, the, 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 the the work behind developing a guideline I mean, is it's really huge. You need huge resources. All right. Dr. Abdullah, it was an excellent presentation, an excellent review for this very important topic. Thank you very much and hope we will have more chances in the future to give us more details and more, more great topics like this. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Take care. Thank you, everyone.